much. And thank you, Mike. Thank all of you who contribute to the Southern Exposure Series, obviously an important series of events on this campus. I also want to give quite a shout, shout out to Dean Taylor Harding of the School of Music, who was uh, inspiration to a lot of us who got involved with thinking 10 years ago, 12 years ago, that maybe we should memorialize Richard Greener, our first black professor and who did so much for this campus. Taylor grabbed onto this informal committee. We, we sort of got together of students, of administrators, of faculty, deans and whatnot, and said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it too. Why not? It was an inspiration to all of us because that gave us, you know, sort of a broad look at something called a university. The School of Music is interested. Then we realized, oh my gosh, the library's interested. Dean McNally started coming to these things. Then the College of Education, Christian Anderson, took a leadership role as a, a co-chair of the event. And uh, the School of Art with Lydia Brandt. So Greener reminded us from the start what the real ideal of a university is. Inclusionary, broad, and diverse. And we have him to thank, we have many to thank, and we're thanking Greener again today. I'm gonna to tell you briefly a little bit about Richard Greener to lead up to what I find one of the most fascinating aspects about that man, and that is, we don't know how he got to South Carolina. Well, we know he got here by train, but we don't really know why he ended up here. We don't know how he was recruited, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just some of the mystery. Greener had a very up and down life, in and out, pleasure and uh, disappointment. And you're gonna hear all of that in the music today and in the words and among the great composers and poets and, and uh, uh, musicians that we hear from today. And that's kind of the message, it's very diverse. So, leading up to how did Greener get to South Carolina, and in fact, later always called himself a South Carolinian. He was born in 1844 to freed slaves in Philadelphia. His parents moved to Boston. He went to good schools, good elementary schools in Boston, but only to age 11 because his father went to the California Gold Rush and was never heard from. So he had no brothers and sisters, no other family. He left school at age 11 to help support his mother. He became an errand boy all over Cambridge. And he was a scrappy kid. He was one of those kids that wanted to meet everybody famous. Ooh, you know, Wendell Phillips is uh, doing an abolition rally. Oh, so is Frederick Douglass. I'll be there, I'll, I'll hang out, whatever, whatever. He was there for everything. He met Charles Sumner, the senator. He uh, often boated on the Charles River with Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. And he was this little kid, but he sort of like got under everybody's skin. <laughs> and had a good time, and made sure they knew him. Eventually, he got a benefactor who sent him first to Oberlin College to really prepare for college. After a year at Oberlin, his benefactor said, you know, I think you really need more. How about Andover Academy? He was the first black student at Andover Academy. And after a year at Andover Academy, his benefactor talked President Hill of Harvard into, in fact, experimenting and seeing if a black student could make it through Harvard. Greener had problems. He wasn't good at math, and that was typical, I found out later, of Andover grads. <laughs> they never emphasized enough math. But um, he was good in Greek, Latin, French. He was wonderful as you'll see, in oratory and public, public speaking and writing. He won prizes at Harvard for that, so he did graduate. 
1870. And jobs weren't like very available for a scrappy black kid with a Harvard education. Oh, for the wealthy white kids with a Harvard education, sure. But he became a teacher. Um, it didn't hurt, to tell you the truth, that he was a light-skinned black individual. I, in doing the book about him, I found that out. It didn't hurt at all that he was a light-skinned black individual. Not that he was passing as white, but he is what they would call today assimilating in the white world to a great extent. He went to work as a teacher at a black school in Philadelphia first and then in Washington, D.C. In both cases, he also took on a sidelight of actually um, speaking about the black cause, about what was needed, about why it was needed, about historically interesting and skilled black figures. And he wrote about this too, in journals and in newspapers and so forth. So he sort of had these two lives, the lives where he made the money and the life he loved to you know, kind of get out there and promote civil rights. He was, in 1873, in his little job in Washington, D.C. high school, and he gets a little letter from the Board of Trustees of South Carolina, Uni University of South Carolina at that time. It had gone from college to university. They had just recently, during um, Reconstruction, managed to integrate, but the only faculty were white. The students had started integrating. The letter asked him if he would be interested, perhaps, in thinking about a professorship. And he goes, what? University of South Carolina. I never, I hardly heard of it. You know, it wasn't on his radar screen at all. And yet, there he was. And he uh, started thinking about it. Uh, he consulted with his then friend, Senator Charles Sumner. And about two weeks later, as he's still thinking about it and thinking what to write back to them, he gets another letter. And the, the next letter he gets from the Board of Trustees is telling him he has been appointed to a professorship in, in languages, philosophy, and evidences of Christianity. I mean, what, what is this? Did they have LinkedIn back then? Did they have ZipRecruiter? I mean, he's just suddenly appointed. And, or another question, of course, is how come the trustees back then worked so fast and now they don't work that fast? But, I mean, that's just, hey, just comes to mind. So he said, yes, I might as well try it. This sounds interesting. He came down here and he realized right away, all his colleagues were white, but they were smart, interesting, white um, professors who had stayed when the university integrated. Many of the white professors and students had left, of course. They didn't like that idea. So Greener took it on himself to actually promote the integration idea, not just to say, let's let them come if they can make it, he actually worked at it. One of the first things he did was realize that the, the, the black students from little high schools in rural South Carolina weren't much prepared. He started a preparatory course. He taught in that preparatory course every day in addition to his other responsibilities at no extra pay. He also lobbied the state legislature which by this time was also integrated during Reconstruction, lobbied them for scholarships for students who couldn't afford, which was, of course, a lot of black students. He got scholarships based on the number of, the number of citizens in every of 34 counties in the state. Another thing he did was go up to Howard University in Washington, D.C., where a lot of very well-prepared South Carolinian black students had gone to get an education before anything else integrated here. 
and he encouraged those that were there to be transfer students. You don't need to be at Howard. We got it back in our state now. So he was an amazing, um, an amazing proponent, an amazing pusher for the black cause, but also for this university. When the librarian at this university, and we had a great library, something like 30,000 volumes over at South, what's now South Carolina Library. When the librarian disappeared, and we never did know why, Greener went over and made himself the acting librarian. He reorganized the library. He had actually seen something like a card catalog at Harvard, which had the first card catalog. That sounds ancient now, but it was really a good thing then. I actually still like card catalogs, but okay. Um, he gave them, in, a, in other words, an organizing system for the first time. All they had were lists. He developed a system of getting books back that had been out with people in the community for years. And he was able to basically save the library for this university. So that was kind of his accomplishments for us. It was, as you will hear in the music, an up and down kind of life of accomplishments for him. He had to leave here when Reconstruction ended. Rutherford B. Hayes was elected. Um, Wade Hampton was elected governor and so forth. The university closed for a while. When it opened, it opened as a college, resegregated, only for white boys. And by gosh, some of those white boys who weren't very wealthy got some of those scholarships that Greener had fought for on account of the black students, but hey, whatever. Uh, Greener went to Washington then. By that time, he had a wife and a couple of kids. His wife was from D.C. anyway. He was in D.C. for a while, and then he did a couple of other amazing things in his life. In the 19, 1880s, he was asked by W.R. Grace to be the executive head of the group that eventually built Grant's tomb, the Grant Monument in, Washington, in New York City. He did that for about seven years. He moved to New York. His family moved to New York with him and uh, did a wonderful job, except that eventually there was uh, sort of dissension and fighting among the board members. And, the board people resigned, and Greener was out too when they resigned, and so forth. So he was always having this ups and downs. Uh, a couple years later, he, he had, was still doing his speaking, his public speaking, his, his writing, and he was asked to do a lot of campaigning for President McKinley. When McKinley won, Greener was appointed another first to be the first black diplomat in a majority white country, which was Russia. He went to Vladivostok, Russia. He loved it. His family stayed here. His family stayed in New York. Um, he loved it in Russia. Had a great time. At a very interesting time, the Boxer Rebellion, the Russo-Japanese War, etc. Yet, of course, we know McKinley died. Teddy Roosevelt came in. He recalled Greener and others. He wanted his own appointees. Greener never really liked that idea. He never really understood the politics of it. Why can't I just stay? I've done a great job. But it wasn't that easy. So he came back. By this time, his wife and children, the children were pretty grown, all light-skinned blacks had decided to change their name and pass for white and uh, he never saw them again. It, it was a blow. He came back to South Carolina a number of times. He spoke, he came to campus, he went to South Carolina on a library. He, then he did not tell anybody who he was. It was an all white campus and he was a little bit afraid he might get kicked off. But he came to campus and looked around. He, did a speaking tour several times in Charleston area, out at Orangeburg, and so forth. 
He loved South Carolina. He called himself, would introduce himself as a South Carolinian, although he didn't live here a very long time. Eventually, he retired in Chicago, lived with um, fam distant, distant family members, and uh, sort of kept involved in things. He was at some of the early meetings of groups that became the NAACP, but he was getting older. He lived, I looked on a map, he lived a block from the house that Barack Obama lived in in Chicago. He was near the University of Chicago and he loved walking to the university. They'd let him borrow books and stuff. And you know, it was, it was a good retirement life. It wasn't easy though. He felt like he was unknown and kind of out of it. So the lesson in all this is to listen in the music for some of these ups and downs. I mean, this was an amazing person, but any ups he had were hard fought and difficult and not, not at all lasting, shall we say. The good times come and go, in other words. And I think of words that we have in, in, in what we're gonna hear and, and to, today, words like, um, pioneer. He was a pioneer, but it's not easy to be a pioneer. It's not always the best thing, and, the, and it can be difficult. You break trail and then you fall in a hole. Uh, same thing with glory. Glory sounds very celebratory, but people with glory teach us a lot and have taught us a lot, but not without some expense on their own part. So think of those things as you listen today to the words, the music, these beautiful poets, I call them, who have, have done these words and music and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream, the dreamer's dream. Let it be that great, strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog, of mighty crush the weak. I am the young man full of strength and hope, tangled in that ancient endless chain of profit power, gain, of grab the land, of grab the gold, of grab the ways of satisfying need, of work the men, of take the pay, of owning everything for one's own greed. I am the farmer, bondsman to the soil. I am the worker, sold to the machine. I am the Negro servant to you all. I am the people, humble, hungry, Mean, hungry yet today, despite the dream, beaten yet today. Oh, pioneers, I am the man who never got ahead. The poorest worker bartered through the years, yet I'm the one 
who dreamt our basic dream in the old world while still a serf to kings. Who dreamt a dream so strong, so brave, so true that even yet its mighty daring sings in every brick and stone and in every furrow toned that made America the land it has become. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shores and Poland's plains and England's grassy lee and torn from black Africa strand I came to build a homeland of the free. <laughs> Thank you. 
the millions who have nothing for our pain, for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pain except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, that land that never has been yet and yet must be. The land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me, who made America, whose sweat and blood, whose faith and pain, whose hand out the foundry, whose plow and the rain must bring back a mighty dream again. Sure, call me any ugly name you choose, but still a freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet, I swear this oath, America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of craft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain, all, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again.
Consider the Negro at his best. I cite the case of a manly and accomplished gentleman of his race. His life has no background. What we mean by ancestry is lacking to him. And not only is it lacking, but its lack is proclaimed by his color, and he is always reminded of it. Be who he may and do what he may, when the personal test comes, he finds himself a man of heart, a marked man. There is a difference between the discrimination against him in one part of the country, the South, and in another part, the North, but it is a difference in degree only. He is not anywhere in a fellowship and complete equipoise with men of the other race, nor does this end it. The boundless sweep of opportunity, which is the inheritance of every white citizen of the Republic, falls to him curtailed hemmed in a mere pathway to a few permissible endeavors. A sublime reliance on the ultimate coming of justice may give him the philosophic temper, but his life will bring chiefly opportunities to cultivate it. And for his children, what better? To those that solve great social problems with professional ease, I commend this remark that Mr. Lau is said to have made. I am glad I was not born a Jew, but if I had been born a Jew, I should be prouder of that fact than any other. You could find many who are glad they were not born Negroes. But can you find a man who, if he had been born a Negro, would be prouder of that fact than of any other. When you have found many men of this mind, then this race problem will, owing to some change in human nature, have become less tough. But until then, patience and tolerance.
liberty throughout all the land adorn that majestic and glorious bill, offering hope for those long school.
and diminish our worth. I search for you. Who am I? To seek a dwelling in equity by awakening to solace through transitions packed into carpet bags and canvases. I go there to advocate. Condemned to dwell as mutely rot, without voice, without muse, I reach for them.
Oh, 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 oh,